I've gotten into a bit of a jam with some luminaries uh, of the Likud over something I wrote concerning a statement Bibi made. Bibi made a statement with words to the effect of that um, it's, it's not possible for us to annex uh, Gaza. It was a very controversial statement, and it shows why there's been so much confusion about the day after. In my humble opinion, when you have a very complex matter, sometimes the complexity is a ruse, and it's used as an excuse not to make the most appropriate decisions. And in this case, um, I've been promoting the notion of annexation with, of course, the removal of the resident Arab population. So this is what I wrote. And I want people to understand this is the only thing I wrote. It was not exactly ad hominem, but it came close, I admit. I said, Netanyahu's inability or unwillingness to understand the necessity of annexing Gaza will condemn our southern front communities for recurring October 7 type invasions and persistent rocket attacks. This is a classic example of Netanyahu's, quote, misconception, end quote, in believing that somebody else could effectively police Gaza. That's simply not possible. Bibi's failure to comprehend this incontrovertible fact suggests that we desperately need clear thinking at the top, end quote. And to back up what I said, there was an article that came out today indicating that Hamas has now initiated a, a training program for new recruits, thousands of them. And of course, they're acquiring these people or they're attracting these people rather with food and all, all manner of humanitarian aid that they have uh, basically uh, hijacked over the past eight months. Well, there is there so is a there is a, there is a glut there is a glut of food and other supplies in Gaza today. Correct. More than they Correct. ever had, in actual fact. More than they've ever had. So, this notion that you know annexation can't is is not appropriate. Not that it can't work, but is in, inappropriate. Uh, because we can get somebody else to go in there and police these people is insane. Because if we know what Hamas is doing right now to rebuild their forces, and in fact, they have withheld some of their their elite units for the day after. That is, they've melted, melted into the civilian population uh, basically to wait until we withdraw and then they can regather their arms and uh, come up out of the uh, tunnels and reestablish uh, control, Hamas control of the area. Well, if we know this right now, right, um, there is no way in the world that any other country is going to submit their military forces to what will inevitably be a meat grinder or a war of attrition within that, within that area, that small area. You're dealing with a hostile population that is still fully in support of Hamas and its goals, because Hamas is a reflection, actually, of the civilian pop quote civilian population there. Not not an and, imposed authority. No, not at all. They were democratically elected. I mean, with a higher percentage of support than Adolf Hitler, Yemok Shmo, and the Nazis got initially from from the from the German people. You think about that for a while. So. People have said that I was disrespectful to the prime minister and that I didn't show enough uh, appreciation for his efforts to get me home, whatever. You know, I'm only concerned with the land and people of Israel. That's all. Uh, my personal relationship or obligation or my thanks to others for whatever reason to get me home pale in comparison. They're irrelevant. Our people are dying right now. We have suffered the, the worst assault since the Hurban, since since the Holocaust. 
and I'm not going to stand on on some idea of of politeness um, in order to call a spade a spade that that things are wrong and have to change. And this whole notion that annexation has been taken off the board for whatever reason is actually causing us to have more casualties right now in Aza. Because ideally, there shouldn't be any left in Aza right now. There shouldn't be. They should just let us conduct a, um, a policy of an, a campaign of annihilation with regard to the armed uh, threat that, that continues not only to exist there, but to grow. So we're past being polite to people. We're past being polite. Um, we have to do what's right by our, our soldiers, our Hayalim, our sacred soldiers, and by our people. And that means we have to look at a situation like Gaza clearly and to understand that like the lowlands were to Great Britain, Gaza is a knife pointing at our heart. And we have to eliminate that threat, that knife. We have to eliminate it. And the best way of doing it, I'm not calling for slaughtering people, chas v'shalom. I'm calling for us to forcibly remove the, the swamp, drain the swamp, so to speak, in Aza that, that produced Hamas, and then go after Hamas and eliminate them, if necessary, fighter by fighter, person by person, terrorist by terrorist, until the whole area is to quote an American general fighting in the, during the Philippine insurrection, a, quote, howling wilderness. That's an American quote, by the way. It's not something I made up. So if it's good enough for the Americans, well, it's good enough for us as well to make Gaza a howling wilderness. And then we can repopulate it, rebuild it, and get on with it. So I'm sorry if some people viewed what I said as a rebuke of our uh, prime minister, but um, he has to wake up. He has to understand is, that I'm, this I'm is sorry. not, I'm not here talking I, about thinking beyond. Here I must disagree with you, Jonathan. When you say he must wake up, you're assuming, you're implying that he is capable of waking up. And I believe this to be an impossibility because Benjamin Netanyahu, even if we give him all possible bene benefit of the doubt that his intentions, that he's well-intentioned, that he truly desires to uh, safeguard and protect the Jewish people and, and is ultimately concerned with their welfare, even if all of that is given, one could dispute perhaps some of those statements, but if, even if all of that is given, at root he is a secular, that is to say, irreligious, uh, atheist, liberal. Correct. That's who, that's who he is. Yes, he's Jewish. Yes, he's a proud Jew. Yes, he comes from an ideologically uh, active and uh, very motivated uh, family. Correct. Connected to the revisionist Zionist movement, etc., etc. All that is true. But... Uh, Jabotinsky, the, the founder of that stream of Zionism himself, was a liberal. This is written by himself in his own hand in his collected letters, which I happen to have on the shelf just over here, not far from where I'm sitting. And I know, therefore, that's what he said. That's how he describes himself. He's a liberal. So if you believe in this amorphous, ill conceived concept of liberalism, and you do not have a clear moral compass, then you are incapable of understanding or seeing many things. The only, the only reason that I attributed or I attribute his ability to recognize the indisputable necessity for annexation is not out of ideological uh, conviction, but out of political necessity. Out of, a out of a need for, for safeguarding his legacy, out of somehow atoning for the sin that he, he, he was guilty of and that led to October 7th. I'm not saying then that his recognition of the need 
or the propriety of annexation is due to some kind of uh, ideological understanding of what we need to do. It's simply an acknowledgement that he understands um, what is best for him politically. Uh, his reputation in the West was, is, and will always be in tatters. Uh, certainly his, the arrest warrant that will continue to hang over his head as issued by in, in the Hague, um, you know, puts paid to any redemption that he might uh, hopefully uh, acquire going forward. So, I mean, the point is, I, I suggested this in the hope that he would see the political advantages to doing it, his personal political advantages. Um, I haven't heard back from him yet. I welcome a response. I welcome a debate with him, in fact, over the propriety of annexation verse, versus what? There's nothing else. I should, I should perhaps mention, I should perhaps mention that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was uh, last night, he appeared last night on uh, the popular program known as the Patriots, a Patriotim, on Channel 14. Mm -hmm. And uh, I deliberately... Uh, watched a recording of it today in order to to hear from the horse's mouth what what he what he has to say and how he presents his positions and the interviewer asked him and implied very clearly that he himself the interviewer is in favor of such a, a suggestion that uh, Israel needs to uh, build Jewish settlements in Gaza or areas or certain areas within the Gaza strip as they once existed and only this will guarantee, first of all, this will, would be exacting a real painful price from our enemies for, for their actions. And, and B, this would be, be the only way to guarantee uh, future security. Without, without a constant Israeli presence on the ground, there will not be security for, for any, any part of Israel anywhere near the Gaza Strip. That's, that was the question. Netanyahu's yeah. response said... Uh, I'm a realist, and Jewish settlement in Gaza is not realistic. And that, it occurred to me, I'm sorry, let me just continue for one moment. It occurred to me that this past Shabbat, two days ago, and leading up to this coming Shabbat, this coming Saturday, when in most communities the parasha, the section of the Torah, in, in the book of Domidbar uh, Sinai, the book of Numbers, known as Shalach Lecha, the parasha there, that section describes the sending of spies from the desert to spy out the land uh, to ascertain how to go about conquering this, this land in which there were inhabitants, the Canaanites. And they were sent by Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, and they were to gain, gather intelligence and bring it back to, to the leadership. Right. Ten out of the twelve spies came back and said, it's not realistic. It ca cannot be done. We were as grasshoppers in their eyes. We were as grasshoppers in their eyes. <laughs> we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. And uh, this whole idea of, of entering this country and, and uh, conquering it is just not, not on, on the table. It's not realistic. And we've been misled. And Moshe Rabbeinu is a uh, is a charlatan. Uh, he took us out of Egypt on false pretenses. That that was that's the story of the of the ten out of the twelve spies. Only two of the, the twelve. Miragalim. Miragalim. The Miragalim in Hebrew. Miragalim was spies. Only two out of the twelve. Yoshua bin Nun, Joshua, and Caleb and ben Caleb. Eh, Caleb. Uh, only the two of the twelve said, "No, no, no. We we're definitely capable of doing this, and we must act according to Hashem's instructions and will. And anything that Hashem instructs us to do, we can do, and it's realistic, and we're we we will succeed." Now we all know the end of that story. Mm. <laughs> the end of that story was that the the ten, forty years in the desert, the ten 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 of the twelve were were struck down. Uh, by divine providence, and, and many other Jews died and suffered as a result, and 40 years spent in the desert. An entire generation had to die in the desert for that reason. 
And Netanyahu, unfortunately, the truth has to be stated plainly, unequivocally, and without any apology, uh, Netanyahu is just another Meragel. When in, in that sense, at least with regards to such issues, because he says it's not realistic, when in fact it's extremely realistic. I'm not even saying you have to. Talk, he doesn't have to talk about it today explicitly what he plans to do there in in, in X number of months or years, but you should not come out and say at this point that's unrealistic. That's not that's not in the cards. Um, that shows to me at least, it confirms that his uh, understanding of our history and our faith is sorely lacking because it it was very unrealistic to assume that after nearly 2,000 years of exile that we would come back and regain our sacred land. Jew Jewish history. Every, everything everything Jewish. in this country is not yeah. realistic. Right. But Again, still it happened. Jewish history, going back to the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher Moshe Moses, to the present, down to the present day, including the the the, the Zionist enterprise, teaches us, if anything, it teaches us one thing: that the only realistic thing is to do the will of Hashem. Correct. That's the only realistic policy. And all the other policies which are presented to us as pragmatic, realistic, um, and uh, conducive to positive relations with the nations of the world and, and creating peace and harmony amongst, for, amongst mm. all men. All those other policies, following uh, foreign religions and ideologies and practices, trying to fit in, blend in with everybody else, as, as uh, our friend... Uh, Uriel England pointed out in his article, mm -hmm. all those policies are, are the one guaranteed path to, to failure and destruction. So far, every realist, quote, realistic policy that's been adopted uh, since Oslo has been an abject failure and has led to nothing more than a flood, a river of Jewish blood. You could go back Oslo. before Oslo. What about what about the so-called Camp David Accords? You can go back to Camp David. In fact, you can go back to the pre-state days with the 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 left's belief in Sablanut uh, and uh, Havlaga and all those other left-wing ideologies they had. You can do that. All of these things were considered realistic, and all of them were abject failures. And so. For him to say that, as he did in this uh, interview, it's not realistic. Well, you know what? Maybe it's not realistic to keep him as prime minister. Then. I mean, there are a lot of people that protest outside my house every Monsi Shabbos that say just that. For, for, for other reasons. However. For much other reasons, for, un, for invalid reasons. But again, when you talk about what's realistic, after October 7th, in particular, what may be realistic is to have a change of government. That may be realistic. Yes. The, the, what the may point. be realistic is the Likud itself to, to bring a new person forward to be the, the Rosh Hashanah, the prime minister. Maybe that's realistic. What would you think of that? Or is that not realistic? I, the, the point as I think made. I told you, um, so, I, I have talked to a lot of people in the various hotels around where we live in Yerushalayim who are evacuees from both the north and the south. And I'll just deal with the people in the south right now. When I ask them, when you think about the future, going back to your homes, what do you think about Gaza? And their answer is very very uh, uniform, I'll put it. It's a uniform answer I get from all these people. And that is, we don't want to see any of them in Gaza anymore. Not one, not after what happened. There will be no security for our Southern communities if there is one of them still living in Gaza. And these are people who, who were 
uh, dedicated leftists. And I, I haven't pointed out the irony. I, I, I wouldn't do that to point out the irony that their policies that they've, that they've now come to uh, make uh, Rehavim Zaevi, um, Gandhi, um, um, a.k.a. Gandhi, a may well, as well be a avenged. Well, a, a well-known uh, right-wing politician. Correct. Politician. Sound like a, a Peace Now a member. And um, I understand where they're coming from. They got out by the skin of, by the grace of God, they survived. And they they don't want to go back to the reality of pre-October 7, 2023. That's the reality that they know about. And apparently it's one that Mr. Netanyahu has forgotten quite conveniently. Because if he did remember the reality of October 7th, he would have resigned on October 8th, along with all the other generals responsible for that khurban right. that occurred. Quite, quite right.